I am Julie Richardson. I'm going to talk to you about bronchiolitis and I would doubt there's anyone in the room who doesn't know all about bronchiolitis, so you could probably do my talk for me. And Chris stole a lot of what I was going to talk about, so <laughs> it's just good to know we're all going to say the same things. So bronchiolitis, um, it's something that we see every winter and it stretches paediatric resources every winter and we're surprised every winter. So without doubt, you will see some children with bronchiolitis next winter. Um, they present, as you know, in two different ways. You've either got the little one who is apneic or more commonly the child with respiratory distress. So let's talk about the apneic baby first. So for paediatricians, we're not that surprised when babies are apneic because neonates do that a lot. But if you're an adult physician, it's quite disconcerting. And if you're the parent, it's really disconcerting. Now, mostly these little babies come in and they have little apneas, but they self-resolve. They're very brief. We pop them on a little bit of oxygen and they're better. Occasionally, they're a little bit more troublesome and something you will not read in any book or any randomised control, the magic of the pointy finger. <laughs> so, all neonatal nurses know this, you just prod them and they remember to breathe. <laughs> and if you do that a few times with their oxygen, many of these will just settle down, breathe away and get better. However, there are also the ones that are much, much naughtier than that. And these are the ones that are having prolonged apneas who go navy blue, they're sats you don't want to look at, and they look really awful and they need bag mask support. Now, if they do that once, okay. If they're doing it more than a couple of times in an hour, they probably need our help. That's them saying, please help me. Um, and there's a few things you can do to help. So obviously oxygen to start with. Um, if you have nasal CPAP available, I found that that can work with some of these babies, so a little nasal mask. Um, is it the CPAP that works or just the whole struggle of putting them in the hat and putting all the equipment on, causing stimulation? It might be that. But then there's the group who are really are struggling um, and are in respiratory failure. And they require intubation. Um, and of course, these are the little ones that are usually only two to three weeks old, so the anaesthetist is coming along thinking, this is out of my comfort zone. But the paediatrician standing beside me will be like, I would intubate this baby in the neonatal unit, but this is not my environment. Um, so there are skills to be used. So the good news when you intubate these little babies is they're usually really easy to ventilate. They don't usually have loads of secretions. They're usually on those basic settings that Chris was telling you about. And once you've got them secured in the tube in the right place, which is very easy to get wrong. Half a centimetre makes such a difference. So in a baby like this, you're probably talking, again, I love the microcuff tube, so the black line tells you, but wait, at, in the first couple of weeks of life, you're probably talking about nine centimetres at the lips. Um, half a centimetre and it's down the right main bronchus, so you really have to take care and attention with them. But once you've got them settled, they usually ventilate really easily and two to three days later they extubate and they're great. When you measure their pH, they can be terrible. So this winter, the first two weeks of our winter season, this is what we seem to do every single day, maybe two or three times a day. We had a whole load of babies that just decided they weren't breathing, needing bag mass support. When we measured their pH, which we, you know, it was kind of obvious they needed support, but many of them had pHs of 6.8 as they come into, into ED, so they were really struggling. So, caffeine, something that I have to say was never been in my repertoire, um, not something I'd thought about until I moved here and it was something that was used a lot. And to be quite honest, when people ask me about use of ca caffeine and apnea, I really didn't know, it's not something I'd use. So I looked at the evidence and at that time, there really was, I was no evidence. There was one case series um, suggest, looking at this, which had about 10 patients and thought it might be useful used to using it in neonates, it, it works very well for like under 32 weeks, but not older than that. So I really wasn't sure. So when people said, what do you think, should we use caffeine? I was like, well, I wouldn't personally recommend it, but 
why, why not? If you feel that you should try it, go for it. And then about two, three years ago, there was a big randomized controlled trial in South America. Um, and they looked at using caffeine for apnea in bronchiolitis. It's not the best trial in the world, but it's the only one we have. Um, and really they found it made no difference in whether or not you got intubated. So therefore, I don't think there's any evidence for it um, and it's not something I would personally recommend. Does it cause harm? I really don't think there's any evidence of that either. So if you feel that it's worth a try, then okay. Um, what I would say about caffeine, really useful at around the point of intubation and when the transport team come, because it's always 3 a.m. Always. <laughs> and we all know that. So caffeine for the team, probably a good idea. So let's talk about the main bulk of patients, which we see all the time. They've got respiratory distress and babies are fantastic at telling you that they're sick and they're working hard. You just don't, you know, you don't need your stethoscope. You can, and that's really he helpful for older patients, toddlers who don't want you near them in paediatrics, but these little ones, which we're talking about, bronchiolitis, they've got respiratory distress, they've got subcostal recession, they've got intercostal recession, they've got tracheal tug. You can tell that before you go near them. The respirate is up, it's up at 60, it might be up at 80. Um, they may be grunting. Grunting worries me much more than any of the rest. Respiratory distress is a way of the baby trying to sort out itself. It doesn't mean intubation is required. It means I'm not very well. Um, so respiratory distress is a really good sign. Then you put your stethoscope on and you hear them wheezy and crunchy and you're like, right, where's my nebs? Note. <laughs> so taking a step back, we see hundreds of bronchiolitic children every winter. And the first thing I always ask myself when I am referred a child with bronchiolitis, am I sure it's bronchiolitis? Because it's so easy to miss the needle in the haystack. So easy, there's another one, another wheezy, you know, to see another child with respiratory distress and think, label everything in bronchi as bronchiolitis. So the children with respiratory distress, as, as Chris was saying, there's always one who has rampant heart failure and the treatment will be different. There's always a few who have pertussis and you may struggle with ventilation. You might have a lymphocytosis on your bloods that might give you a clue you might really be struggling with oxygenation. And with the apneic babies, the differential di diagnosis is much wider. So is this a septic baby? Is this a baby with intra-abdominal badness? Is this a child who has actually been involved in an NAI? So you've got to think wider. And especially if somebody's deteriorating, just always have the question in your head, am I sure this is bronchiolitis? In terms of medicines and things we can do, we like to treat people, don't we? We like to get the cardex out and write lots of things. We like to make patients look better. So as a paediatrician, I have seen lots of therapies come and go over my time. When I started, we used to have these big, like massive head box things that we put the whole baby in. And we'd put ribavirin aerosol into, the, into this box, which was great because it caused this white mist and you couldn't see the baby was working hard anymore. So it was brilliant, so you stopped worrying about them because you couldn't see them. Downside was it didn't work and there were a number of really bad critical incidents, so we don't do that anymore. And then we went through salbutamol because they're wheezy, so let's do that, makes us feel good. Then we went Atrovent and then more recently we were like, well, what about adrenaline? Adrenaline's good for everything, isn't it? And it became a trend, and all these trends have come and gone. And there is no evidence that routinely using any of those things makes a difference. Now, in a particular individual, it might. So when your back's against the wall, am I against you having a go with it? No. But if you're going to do it, go back and check it made a difference. Don't just do it because it makes you feel like you're doing something. And particularly when we were more aggressive in ICU and using some of these things, actually it prolonged stay because you're actually agitating the baby and you know, salbutamol makes you feel a bit rubbish, it puts your heart rate up, it makes you look worse, particularly if it's not doing anything. So 
quite honestly, we really wish there was a treatment for bronchiolitis. There isn't. It is time. Um, and the drugs don't work. It is about supportive therapy, good nursing care, paying attention, oxygen, monitoring, feeding, hydration. Um, it really is about supportive care. And that does not change when you come to intensive care. That's what we do too. Bronchiolitis gets worse for the first few days and then it will get better. And that's say, for the vast majority, that's exactly what happens in intensive care as well. So, haven't mentioned high flow. Time to talk about it. So when I first met high flow, which was about 12 years ago, I really was not impressed. It's nasal cannula. It doesn't look very fancy. It doesn't have any many buttons on it. It's not an ECMO circuit. I was like, what does this do? It doesn't look like it could do anything. Now, I, my practice changed, actually mostly by seeing what was happening in my adult colleagues' practice, and they were having success with it post-extubation in adults or even pre. And I was like, well, if this works in an adult, why on earth wouldn't it work for children? And I now know it's common practice in neonates, but it wasn't when I was training. I'm also getting old. <laughs> so high flow, we use it a lot. Um, and we use it much more than the evidence would suggest we should. But it's easy to use, it's well tolerated, and it's safe. What we tend to do for this group of patients, we're talking about the bronchiolytic group, um, two litres per kilo per minute. That's where we start. That's, and you titrate your oxygen up and down. So how does it work? Honest truth, nobody really knows. But, but we think it works like this. Number one, it's got humidified oxygen. So you've got oxygen, which we know is a good thing for these kids. It's humidified, which is a good thing. We've got, we've got obligate nasal breathers for most of them, so we don't want them to have crusty noses, so hopefully it'll, it'll reduce that. Um, and it also improves your mucociliary escalation, escalator and helps you breathe. It reduces dead space because all that pharyngeal space is dead space usually, and you're giving it flow, so it reduces dead space reduces the work of breathing and clears your CO2. It also reduces inspiratory resistance because this flows so fast that it improves that and it increases your functional residual volume. And it also produces a little bit of PEEP. The evidence for that is very variable and at two litres per kilo per minute, it's probably only about four of PEEP, which is not a lot, but a little bit. As I said, the use of high flow has exponentially taken off because it's easy to use and it's very well tolerated. The evidence for it is sort of falling behind, but is, you know, there, is, there are now some studies. And high flow came into paediatric intensive care for bronchiolitis based on a couple of studies back in 2011, 2012, which looked retrospectively at what happened with intubation rate when they had um, before high flow and then the season afterwards when they had high flow. And they found they were intubating less patients, which had to be a good thing. The difficulty with that retrospect, maybe it was just a different season, so difficult. Um, and then there's been a number of other studies. So the high flow study came along, didn't really show any difference. Um, Kerprotes et al, which is, um, an Australian study only used one mil per kilo and felt that there was a little bit of, sorry, one litre per kilo and found there was a little bit of difference. And then the Tramontane study came along and tried, most studies have looked at two litres per kilo in this age group. Tramontane came along and said, well, how about if we turn it up, does it make a difference? And they found it didn't make a difference in terms of intubation and deterioration, but it did make a difference in terms of agitation. Um, it was less well tolerated at higher pressures. But, it's, but it did not cause more trouble, such as pneumothoraces, which is what people worry about. So for a short period of time, it might be appropriate to turn things up a little while you're setting up for intubation. 
And then came the Paris trial, which has been the one that's big news and all over the place, mostly I think because it's got a trendy name, but also because it was the biggest study. It's 1,300 patients. And it's the Paris stands for Paediatric Acute Respiratory Intervention Study. Um, and they were comparing standard oxygen therapy and, it, and um, high flow therapy at two litres per kilo from admission. And what they found was that the number needed to treat was nine, which was all very impressive. But their outcomes were maybe not what I am so interested in. So their outcomes were looking at respiratory rate, heart rate, Pew score, and if you were, if those were raised, you would, most people, if you were on standard oxygen, would then put you on to high flow oxygen. They weren't looking at, well, did you need intubation and did it prevent intubation? The other thing about the Paris study, it was done in Australia. <laughs> Nothing to do with Paris whatsoever. And it's one of those quirks of trials currently that quite often their trendy name has got nothing to do with, but it makes you remember it. So it was published as this in, recently in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you use high flow, I think it's worth a read. Um, it is one of the biggest studies to date. Has it convinced me that high flow is the panacea to, um, to bronchiolitis from the outset? Absolutely not. Um, what it has established is that it is superior to oxygen, that it's safe and that you can do it on a ward. And for those that are absolutely advocates of high flow, this was sort of justification. And it has convinced a lot of other people who have been not so sure, should we use it, to use it. So it is absolutely safe. It can be used on a ward. And it um, certainly seems to make a difference in terms of symptoms, which is great. So we've now got something that we can do and that Generally, the feedback, some of the studies I've looked at is feedback from what parents think of it and what nursing staff think of it, and they think it works. And certainly, we use a lot of this in intensive care, not just in bronchiolitis, and I, it does appear to work. But the evidence is not as strong as I would like, and I think there's still more, many more trials to be done. And is it superior or equal to non-invasive ventilation? those trials are just beginning to be done at this point in time. So I think, you know, it, it is a very useful thing. It's something we would recommend at this level and it may help a number of babies out. But on the other side, just to be a little bit controversial, before it came along, not every baby got intubated. Okay, so you can survive without high flow because I know there's now a group of people who have never, you know, never lived without high flow. So it didn't mean an automatic admission to intensive care. And just in case there's any paediatric intensivists out there, you can extubate to just oxygen. It's possible, a bit old school, but it is possible. <laughs> because I think, you know, having these things are great, but sometimes it can actually extend your length of stay because you're not weaning them. The other good thing about this trial in bronchiolitis, they didn't wean high flow. Once you had been in air for four hours, they stopped it um, and it, they had no problems with that. Obviously, a few were restarted, but they just stopped. Uh, once you'd been in air for four hours, they stopped it. And that is the Australian practice. They wouldn't tend to wean high flow. Now, in ICU with more complicated patients, of course we do, it's for a different thing, but it is possible and safe and you can move your patient through. So, when do we actually intubate? Um, so we intubate for respiratory failure, not respiratory distress. So it's pretty obvious, so hypoxemia. So we're failing to get this child to saturate in the high 80s, low 90s, despite maximal oxygen, high flow, cannot get them to oxygenate. Or you've got these profound apneas, which are requiring recurrent bag mask intervention. And then there's exhaustion. And I know it's really tempting just to go, well, that child's working really hard, let's intubate them. But if you do that, they are going to get worse first because you're taking away all their natural ability to, to get better. So exhaustion rarely happens on its own. 
There are babies out there that can breathe for at 80 breaths per minute for days and will get better um, and be a little bit tachycardic, but actually they look quite bright. The ones that are exhausted usually are also struggling with oxygenation. Their respiratory actually might be coming slower. They're grunting. They look pale and rubbish. <laughs> um, and they really are just struggling. So, and I think because of high flow, people are less tolerant of respiratory dis distress, which is one of the downsides of it because you're, you know, a few years back, you just watched these patients and you worried about them because um, there are many that, you know, some that will come to us, but there's just as many, if not more, that suddenly turn that corner and get better. So it's a difficult one, the exhaustion one, and it does take skill and the paediatricians see these children every year and have a lot of experience. Whereas you, if you're coming as an anaesthetic um, response who doesn't deal with children all the time, I can understand completely that you take one look at this child who's like staring, touching their backbone and your automatic thoughts are, let's intubate them, <laughs> they don't look well because an adult doing that would be a disaster. So I think you need to use the skill around you. When we come to intubation, now both Jeremy and Chris touched on this, it really is about teamwork. So paediatricians think of anaesthetists as superheroes. And of course you are. <laughs> and of course you are. And since most of my colleagues are, they definitely are, all right? <laughs> but as we've said before, you know, neonates and small children may be well out of the comfort zone of your your anaesthetist who's coming to see this child. The good news is at this point, the paediatrician standing beside you is likely to have done quite a lot of neonates, is quite likely to be very comfortable with intubation of a small child, and it's using those skills together. However, invariably, especially in, in most places I've worked, we then take this child to theatre, which the anaesthetist is immediately very comfortable in that environment. The paediatrician definitely is not. Doesn't know where anything is, doesn't know what that machine in the corner does, doesn't you know, know the equipment. So I think if you're a team that comes together only at 3 a.m., which is quite often, perhaps it's useful to think and do, if you're gonna do simulation and train, that you actually go to the environment that you do it and just you know, share your skills. And remember that there may be somebody else that could do the intubation, or it may, not, it may be appropriate, or somebody that's certainly a skilled helper. So it is about teamwork. Um, again, we've talked about straight blades. It's what you use with most bronchiolytics. It gives you a nice view. But again, if you're not used to it, it is different. Um, and if you're only using a straight blade when in, at 3 a.m., then you probably need to try it at another time. Um, and the person, the pedi paediatricians, as I say, very happy with the straight blade, very unhappy when there's a child with teeth. It's quite funny, actually. <laughs> um, and dope. Um, Chris has gone through in detail, but this is really important for these little ones. So is the tube displaced? It takes a fraction of half a centimetre in these little tiny babies and the tube is either out or it's more likely down the right main bronchus. So take care and attention of where you put that tube. Um, Microcuff tube, which we tend to use, the black line is perfect. Um, I'm quite happy if you put in an oral tube. Our paediatricians in this in Northern Ireland have all learned to do nasal intubation, so we'll be more comfortable in doing that as the first instance. So do what you are used to doing. Don't start doing something different just because you're in an acute situation. So obstructed with these babies, it's always secretions. And when I intubate a bronchiolytic, the first thing I do after I'm happy that I've got my cube tube <laughs> secured is that I do suction straight away um, and then and ventilation in the first couple of hours can be tricky in some of these babies and it's usually always because of secretions so lots of um, suction saline suction get the physio in if you need to 
um, but it really does help clear the tube out. Pneumothorax, less common, but it does happen. Ultrasound's good, chest x-ray could do. Clinical signs for little babies are really not great. Um, you're not going to get tracheal deviation and things. Um, those of you that work in neonates so you'd be used to the cold light, you can illuminate the chest. Um, that's quick too, if, if you've got the equipment around. Um, and then equipment and everything that was said, these are small babies. So is your equipment working? Have you got the right small end tidal? Have, if your CO2 is rising, look at what you've got connected. Is there something you can lose? The angle piece, go back to first principles and bag and can you get better numbers doing that? So it really is taking care with the real basics and it makes a difference with these little babies. So in our unit, um, we use this as a checklist for every patient we see. And increasingly, I think it's quite useful for um, any acutely unwell child. So it's A, B, C, D, B, F, F, Daisy. And in case you're wondering who in our Daisy is, this is Daisy. <laughs> yes, we're mad. <laughs> so, so Daisy is our quality and safety mascot in the Royal. Um, and I'm going to be very honest, and ABCD, BFF Daisy did come around as a bit of a joke after a glass of wine, but it has stuck mm -hmm. and it works. <laughs> so with these babies, I think this is useful for any sick child once you've got the basics secured. So you're going to look at airway. Is your tube secure? Is it in the right place? Usually all of these bronchiolytic babies, you'll mostly be a 3-0 microcuff tube. Breathing. So you're going to look at the ventilation. You're going to make sure they're oxygenating. Low 90s is fine. Um, you're going to do it gently. You're going to do six up to seven mils per kilo if you're using or low pressures. We're going to, the gases don't have to be perfect. pH 7.25 with slightly high CO2 is fine. We just want to be gentle with these lungs. Circulation shouldn't be a problem with these babies. Um, <coughs> Circulation is usually stable, um, and in terms of that, when we intubate, my choice of drug would usually be ketamine, one to two milligrams per kilo, with um, paralysis of your choice, rocuronium being a good one. Um, and the reason we use ketamine is because it's cardiovascularly stable, um, and then it's sedate afterwards. Um, yes, it can increase secretions, but in practical terms, I don't find that that's makes life difficult. From a circulation point of view, if you're having problems with circulation, revisit your diagnosis. If you're having to give this child lots of fluid boluses, that they don't have bronchiolitis, they've got something else going on, um, or you've got too much sedation on board, um, watch your propofol, sevoflurane, or midazolam if you've got that running. Bloods, so might surprise the adult physicians amongst us, but um, in, in bronchiolitis per se, we don't do bloods and x-rays. Um, it doesn't make any difference, but obviously when you're sick enough to need intensive care, those should be being done to make sure we've got the diagnosis right. So do, looking at your bloods, have you got a lymphopenia? Have you got pertussis rather than something else? What I would say about bloods, they tell you nothing about whether this is a viral or a bacterial. Um, CRPs up to 100 can definitely happen in viral, bad viral disease. Um, your white cell count doesn't tell you anything either. Fluids, we tend to restrict to two thirds maintenance or 100 mils per kilo if you're a neonate. Um, usually 0.9 and 5, but again, if you're a neonate, you might need some more dextrose because they tend to drop their sugars. Why do we go two thirds? Because they're at high risk of SIADH and hyponatremia. Everybody knows about hyponatremia in Northern Ireland. Um, and the other thing to be careful with fluids is very recently um, there's been a BRUSIP uh, study which has been performed by the Spanish group which looked at um, fluid management in bronchiolitis and found that if you were fluid overloaded in the first 24 hours of ICU admission then you had a much worse outcome, a longer stay, worse disease. So it's something perhaps we should be paying a little bit more attention to. So just because you've got your fluid drawn up 
prior to intubation, which I would say is good practice. Doesn't mean to say just because you've got it drawn up, you have to give it. Use it if it's needed. Food, you guys don't need to worry about too much, but we will feed them as soon as they get to the unit. Um, nutrition helps you get well. Drugs, we've talked about, they don't work. Um, alerts, you've got neonates in this mix, so be careful with your prescribing. Um, be careful with loss of temperature and sugars. <laughs> Infection, bronchiolitis is a viral disease, um, but, and the purists would say you shouldn't use antibiotics, but I'm a, pragma a pragmatist. I would absolutely give these children antibiotics and use what's local to your team. And the neonate is definitely apneic because they're sepsis until proven otherwise. Sedation, we tend to use morphine plus or minus midazolam um, and for transport they will be paralysed so we'll give them a bolus of paralysis. Once you've got your sedation on board if you're using sevoflurane do take, turn it off because they tend to just plummet their blood pressure and then in terms of lines and things the why in intensive care is about why are you in intensive care what why do we still need lines to get rid of plastic and things but for your purposes it's about what really. So in terms of lines you need two good working cannulas or a midline um, we work often off capillary gases, that is perfectly good practice and we use that in intensive care. Um, an arterial line or a central line should be probably reserved for those patients who are needing more ventilation or are in high oxygen um, and they, they, they require that. So what happens when we actually arrive? Um, hopefully we don't turn up and criticise, that's not the plan. <laughs> what we should be doing is, what we do is to continue doing what you're doing. Find out what's going on, look at the settings, look where we're at and then continue your management in, in um, the ambulance. Um, as I say, we usually all, we would want to make sure everything is well secured because we don't want tubes or lines falling out in transit because it's not fun being there. Um, and we usually paralyse them for <coughs> movement. Um, the really difficult ones who were struggling with ventilation and oxygenation, which there will be one or two every year, we may well have to hand ventilate, um, that happens. Um, but the baby log is really good and I can't advocate it enough. It's a great piece of kit and you can usually ventilate people well on it. Um, once we get to intensive care, what do we do? Well, we don't do very much, which you might be surprised to hear. For most of them, if they've got an oral tube, we tend to change it to a nasal, and that's about having a little bit more secure, a little bit more comfortable. And it's also because these days we allow these babies to be pretty awake. Moving around is good phys physio, so we let them be awake. We feed them early, um, and we continue their antibiotics while, while we're waiting for a blind bowel to, be, to come back. If it's negative, we often stop our antibiotics pretty quickly. Um, and most of these babies will get better quite quickly. Um, average length of stay is sort of three to five days. Obviously, we've also got the other group of patients who are much more sick, who may develop an ARDS type illness um, or have other underlying disease which indicate that they get pulmonary hypertension. So those are the babies that we'll put on nitric, we'll put on oscillation. My favorite bit of kit is oscillation, but it, the, the evidence for it is really poor but I love it, it works. Um, and these are then the patients that, if we're struggling with all of that, may well go to ECMO. And our nearest centres for ECMO is usually Glasgow, where I used to work. RS, bronchiolitis is one of the best reasons to put someone on ECMO if you need to have ECMO, because it's a reversible disease. So if we have gently ventilated them and not destroyed their lungs by really working them too hard, and ECMO is available, then it is something that will turn a child around. Um, it is something that can, again, ECMO is not a magic therapy, it just allows time. It is purely supportive. Okay, I think I've said everything. As I said, you were all experts anyway, so any questions I'm happy to take. Just in terms of everything I've talked about, um, there is a bronchiolitis uh, standard operating procedure which will be available on um, the emergency medicine, um, paediatric emergencies site shortly.